Okay, uh, good morning everyone. This is South Sudan NITAC and I'm going to take you very quickly through our presentation. I'll really try to be very fast because I see they are worried about the time. So the presentation outline is basically the same uh, for all the countries, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time going through that. And I'll go straight to the first slide. And the first slide talks about the establishment of NITAC history in South Sudan. I'm happy to tell you that the first NITAC in South Sudan was established through a ministerial order in uh, January 2013. So we are not new and we are not uh, that old and we had a secretariat and the EPI officers were trained in Nairobi in August 2014. However, operations of the NITAC did not take place and reorganization was proposed and a concept note was developed uh, with support from uh, the CIVAC initiative. And generally the, the TINA of the uh, NITAC is four years and they are, they are actually allowed to conduct uh, quarterly and extraordinary meetings depending on uh, what's uh, going to be discussed. And these meetings can be open or closed, which means literally for the core members or including everybody in the NITAC team. And that is, um, in addition to other duties of the NITAC, which include uh, evidence-based recommendations, advice and guidance on vaccines and notifiable diseases of concern. Uh, continuing with the establishment history, uh, the concept note which was later on upgraded to an internal procedures manual served as the basis for re-establishment of the second team of the NITAC, also through a ministerial order in January 2016, that's literally four years after the first NITAC, and uh, this one comprised of 11 core members and 10 non-core members and an orientation workshop was also conducted, one. And uh, that was in April 2016. Now the CITAC was again re-established, that's literally about six years down the line through another ministerial order in December 2022, uh, not very long ago and also a training on evidence-based, uh, on the evidence to recommendation was done in Kampala. Um, not everybody attended, but uh, a good number was represented in that meeting. Now about the NITAC structure and members, uh, the South Sudan NITAC, and we love calling ourselves CITAC, is actually headed by the chairman, who is not here, and the deputy chairman, who is me. And we do have a secretariat and we have our core members and non-core members. The core members are 11 in number and they are from different health specialities ranging from uh, pathologists, microbiologists, public health specialists to finance specialists. The list is actually long. And the non-core members uh, comprise of members from uh, both government and non-government institutions and these are the ex-official members who are from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. And we have the liaison members who are five in number, and this include the Public Health Association, uh, JSI, uh, the Drug and Food Control Authority, WHO, and UNICEF. Now, looking at the secretariat, this secretariat is also formed from members from the Ministry of Health and members from the partners. And this include the National Immunization Program and the uh, Integrated Disease Surveillance Program. And from the licensed members, we have uh, UNICEF, WHO, and JSI. And um, what I'll probably note in this structure is that the weakest link we have here is actually the secretariat. Now, the vaccine recommendations to date. Uh, this was actually a tricky slide because I wasn't sure whether um, they wanted the vaccines that the CTAC has recommended to date or the vaccines that we're using in country. So I decided to take the easier option of listing every single vaccine that we're using in country to cover everyone. So uh, in country, we actually have uh, the BCG, BCG vaccine, which is given at uh, zero age. We do have the pentavalent, which is given at six weeks, 10 weeks, and 14 weeks. And we also give uh, measles vaccines, which is given at nine months. And you read that right, it's measles vaccine only, not MMR. And we have the oral polio vaccine given at six weeks, 10 weeks, and 14 weeks. And we also have the inactivated polio vaccine, which is given at 14 weeks and nine months. 
And we do have the tetanus toxoid and diphtheria vaccines, which are given to women of childbearing age, uh, largely uh, between 15 and 49 years old. And of recent, we do have the COVID-19 vaccines in country. I'm not sure if that's routine or non-routine. And we have the oral cholera vaccine, which is given during emergencies. To continue with the vaccines recommendations today, in the pipeline, we have the malaria vaccine yesterday. The EPI director actually elaborated on that, and hopefully we hope to introduce it next year, which is 2024. And in the pipeline, we're thinking about the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the rotavirus vaccine. Uh, this is why we're here, actually, and it's an ongoing discussion. And we're also thinking about the yellow fever vaccine and the meningitis vaccines. Our main obstacle here is an issue of co-financing. And we're also looking at uh, introduction of hepatitis B birth dos, and the main obstacle is also financing. And in our thoughts, we are thinking also about typhoid and Ebola because um, we have issues around the border and typhoid is really um, a major health issue in the country. Now, specific considerations. We have actually done a little bit of uh, background work on the issue of uh, pneumococcal uh, uh, streptococcal infections and the rotavirus infections and we have reviewed a lot of literature and available data online and one of the documents we looked at is the uh, last mixed survey uh, report that we have in country I mean it's a decade old but that's the best that we have and actually that report found out that the probability of dying before five years is uh, 105 per thousand life births and before one year is 75 per a uh, thousand life births and on average 34 percent of children under five experienced diarrhea two weeks prior to the survey i mean this is serious and we also did uh, take a look at the unicef press re release that was um in 2019 and it says that pneumonia kills a child in south sudan like every hour and that makes the issue very very serious and it's also responsible for 20% uh, of under five deaths in 2018. So uh, we also did take a look at the 2022 Global Humanitarian Report, which cites water sanitation and hygiene as the driving forces behind increases in water and vector-borne uh, diseases. And on top of that is uh, acute diarrhea. And uh, as we are nowhere close to controlling floods and uh, the poor uh, hygiene and sanitation, sanitation situation in the country, I think that makes it a serious case for intervention. And on top of that, we actually did take a look at some uh, data available in the country through our health management information system because we're literally using uh, DHIS2. And that report, the midterm report for 2022, the data also showed that uh, upper respiratory tract infections and pneumonia and acute diarrhea are among the, type, uh, the top five causes of uh, OPD attendance and inpatient admissions. So we feel that we have a strong case. And uh, that's um, a, a bar chart that's taken from the data that we have in country. And as you can see, uh, looking at the, uh, the blue is actually the OPD cases and the red small on the top. I don't know if anybody's seeing that, it's kind of small is the uh, admissions and we can see that uh, now putting the case of malaria aside, we can see that upper respiratory tract infections actually ranges as the second most um, cause of uh, OPD attendance uh, and that is followed by uh, diarrhea and then uh, pneumonia. And we're also aware as we saw in the presentations in the morning that uh, the two are almost caused by the upper respiratory tract infections and pneumonia are caused by the same bacteria streptococcus pneumoniae. So uh, putting them together, I think that um, makes the case very serious. And uh, when we look at the top 10 causes of admissions, we can see that most of the admissions apart from malaria is because of uh, acute diarrhea, which is something around 17,782 uh, admissions, followed by pneumonia and upper respiratory tract infections. And uh, looking at mortality data, uh, we can also see that uh, malaria is the leading cause of mortality, and second to that is pneumonia, and then in the 
fourth position is upper respiratory tract infections, and the fifth position is acute diarrhea. So uh, we have a strong case. And um, in addition to that, the NITEC actually went further to um, look at uh, what interventions are available and uh, what's out there. So we did take a look at the WHO position paper on PCV, which was, I think, uh, um, written in 2019, and also the is one or rotavirus vaccine well, that was written in uh, 2021. And these two papers clearly um, um, tell the clinical significance of pneumococcal rotavirus infections, that they are serious, and the effectiveness of available vaccines, and they also highlighted the need for an intervention. And we did take a look at the Gavi report on extraordinary impact of pneumococcal vaccines, which cites a 95% reduction in the incidence of pneumococcal meningitis in fully vaccinated infants, and the efficacy against all pneumococcal invasive disease was more than 97%, and we were actually happy about that. And we also did look at other reports that were printed out in the Lancet, uh, written in 2020, and Path in 2021, and both reports elaborated on the effectiveness of the rotavirus vaccines, Rotarix and Rotatec, in preventing rotavirus diarrhea. Now, to continue with the specific considerations and interventions, we also did have a look at the such evidence to recommendation framework on product choices of impact, which is PCV13 and PCV10. And we seem to be more inclined towards PCV13, given the fact that we don't have any serious surveillance data in country, but that's something we're yet to look seriously into. And uh, we also did have a look at the evidence recommendation framework, which looks at the four recommended vaccines out there and the number of severe, uh, severe diseases and deaths averted is literally high by all these vaccines. So literally what's left of the CTAC is to conduct more research and uh, more discussions and also seek guidance on the best vaccine type to adapt. That means we need to dig out more local data if possible. And then uh, vaccine sources, I think we can start to explore on that, including funding sources, which is not my job, actually, the EPI department is doing a lot in that direction. And we are also considering the uh, vaccine schedules. We also have seen earlier that uh, the doses are 2 plus and 3 plus, and we already have certain vaccines in country that have the same schedule. So we're looking at the possibility of aligning it to existing programs. And we are also doing some considerations about existing equipment, infrastructure, and training needs in case we decide to adapt the vaccine. Now, specific challenges uh, regarding CTAC South Sudan in making recommendations. One of them is the absence of a multi-year work plan and budget because I you know we, we're all aware that um, a work plan is like a, a compass. It gives direction, it guides you what to do, what not to do, and that's what we don't have, which I think is a very serious thing. And we, uh, apart from that, we also don't have a monitoring evolution and surveillance framework, and we don't have a research ag agenda, which I think, based on the previous uh, presentations, it's a serious matter because by now we should be looking at uh, considering some researches around zero surveillance to guide our recommendations. And uh, we also understand the issue of uh, limited capacity understanding of our members in conducting evidence to recommendations procedures, because as I mentioned earlier, not everybody received the training on evidence to recommendation. And uh, yeah, there's that website which was shared. I mean, the, the previous presenters showed it here. It has a lot of material and it really needs a lot of time to go through that. And uh, I think it's a little bit tricky understanding what's in that website anyway. So I think, uh, my team might require some uh, regular refresher trainings on standard procedures on how to go about making pre um, uh, evidence to recommendations and all the work that the NITEC is supposed to be doing. And uh, apart from that, uh, there's also the issue of the non-comprehensive and outdated TORs that we have, because when we compared it to the latest template that uh, is online, we feel that uh, we need to do something, and that uh, the terms of reference, what we also call the internal uh, procedures manual, might need to be reviewed or updated. And to continue with the challenges, uh, 
Another challenge is the issue of uh, limited uh, operational support, uh, which was what I pointed out earlier, that the weakest link in our structure is actually the secretariat because we don't have uh, dedicated staff, we don't have an office space. Like if you want to go there and do some review on documents, you don't even know where to go, where to sit, that kind of thing. And uh, so I, I think this is serious. We need a secretariat that's fully functional and right now that it's not there. And there's that issue of uh, limited space at the National Vaccine Store. I mean, this is something that we're thinking of because we're here discussing expanding uh, the number of vaccines in country. And uh, um, the EPI department had already discussed about the infrastructure and uh, storage capabilities at the peripheral levels. But now, for us as the CITAG, we're actually getting a little bit worried about that same capacity at the central level because right now we only have um, a moderate store in country, which is, uh, I think, managed by UNICEF. And we really feel that that's something that needs to be improved on, which is why I'm talking of vaccine chain expansion and management. And uh, that's especially important as we are also beginning to think about the issue of uh, public private engagement because there's a, a list of vaccines that we really need in, in country and we don't have them or we don't have like approvals to use them and usually I think the private sector takes that opportunity like where there's a gap they come in and start uh, bringing those vaccines anyhow and I think it's high time that we put in uh, structures to make sure that we're able to regulate that at an earlier stage before things get out of hand. And uh, last but not the least is the limited exposure and networking. I really feel that uh, that needs to be improved on and we need to get membership into both international and regional bodies. And I was really surprised when I logged into the global NITAC network and South Sudan wasn't even there. I mean, I'm here to tell you today that we exist and we deserve to be included there among the other countries as well. Uh, so the objectives from this workshop, uh, the primary objective actually why we're here, I think by the end of this meeting, South Sudan will, I hope South Sudan will be recommended to introduce the PCV and rotavirus vaccines. We're really uh, a step ahead and we're thinking of next year, although the uh, EPI program is thinking of 2025, we really feel it should be introduced yesterday, not today or tomorrow. And uh, we also feel that uh, by the end of this meeting, we'll have developed an annual schedule of trainings and networking opportunities for the NITAC members to improve the understanding efficiency in vaccine decision making. And uh, last but not the least, we feel that the CITAC, by the end of this meeting, the CITAC will have uh, identified uh, technical support to facilitate the development of its work plan, m and &E plan and research agenda and update its terms of reference, which we call the internal procedures manual in order to guide its activities. And with that, I'd say thank you for your attention.